if you found something that's really working for you, then then go for it, man. You do you. Welcome world to Nobody's Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I interview people I find absolutely fascinating, and I believe you will too if you give them a chance. This week's guest is our friend, Lorette Lynn. You might remember her from season one, episode 14, where we talked about trusting and dealing with the first stages of the pandemic. In this episode, she says, bring it on as we explore what changes have happened in her life over the past two years and if she views the world differently or the same. So if you've kept up with me over the past 15 months, you know that I have heavily invested myself in OKC Improv. It is a nonprofit organization that tries to spread awareness of the art form by showcasing world-class talent and offering classes and workshops for students to learn various aspects and practice those in the real world. I am specifically wanting to reach out to those who have teenagers, though everybody can do this. There are classes starting the last week of September, but for teenagers on October 1st. That will give you a couple hours in the afternoon to do something else. Maybe watch college football, go shopping in the Plaza District, who knows. But it has been great for my daughter, and I recommend it to anyone and everyone who wants to build confidence and just have fun. You can check all this out at okcimprov.com, and you can put nobody's a nobody sent you. I absolutely love Lorette. Though we've only known each other for about seven years, uh, she really does feel like a lifelong friend. I... You know, there's just some people in your life that you um, connect with, and this is one of the ones for me. I hope you enjoy this show as we touch base and kind of just talk through the past two years. So here is Lorette Lynn. This is interesting. It wasn't today, um, but it was two years ago, uh, about right now, when your episode got released. So it actually is pretty much a two-year anniversary of when we had the truster. Yeah, look at that. I guess the first question is, do you have a word of the year this year or the promise or anything? Uh, It's more of a phrase this time around, you know? Um, So at the beginning of the year, and again, I don't really do the whole New Year's resolution thing because just kind of setting it up that way never really worked for me. But the energy changes at different times during the year. And I don't know if it's really like that for everyone, or it, it's definitely like that for me. Like there's, I often feel like a bit of stagnation going through the summer, especially with the, the very intense heat waves and it kind right. of amplifies that. And there just seems to be waves of energy. And I think Maybe, maybe it is like this for everyone, or maybe it is just me. I tend to feel like a shift in the energy going into fall. And I, I'm pretty sure a lot of that just has to do with childhood experiences and growing up, going to school. For me in the Northeast, we ended school at the very end of June, unlike May that they do in this part of the country. And we began after Labor Day in September. So we were pretty much off all of July and August. And then we went back to school in September. And every year when I first went back to school, there was a feeling of freshness. There was that kind of clearing of the energy and something new, you know, this whole new semester is starting, a whole new year is starting and you get like those new fresh denim covered binders, you know, and you can start like decorating them and right putting all that. I mean, that I don't know why that was so important to me, but all the new pens and notebooks and all of that stuff and usually had new school clothes and shoes and all of that. So there's definitely a shift in the energy that I feel going into fall. And then you get into the holidays and there's just a lot going on and it's very busy and there's, there's mostly joyous stuff, mostly celebratory stuff, but it is very distracting and overstimulating and can be very overwhelming, especially in my adult life. It got more overwhelming because it's holidays are a different perspective as a parent than they were when you were a child. So then January, and there's just this like kind of reprieve in January and January always seems like such a long month but it does feel like another one of those opportunities to kind of reset and review the the year that you had before and just kind of write down intentions or at least I do I actually I journal a lot I do a lot of journaling and I will write down my intentions for the year to come but they're more like just general intentions like a review of where I've been 
what did I accomplish last year? What did I want to accomplish? And how many of those goals and objectives did I meet? And, you know, where, where I'm, am I wanting to go now? Like, what are my desires moving forward? And January just naturally seems like a good time to do that, despite the fact that it's a new year, or regardless of the fact that it's a new year. So my general intention for this year, and the general feeling I had is, is motion and movement, you know, so the phrase that I wrote in my journal is kind of like, you know, bring it on, you know, (laughs) like, bring it on. I just felt a lot of big changes a lot of big motion, a lot of like big decisions to have to make this year. And I wasn't really sure what those decisions were going to be. I hadn't really clarified yet, but I just felt like, okay, you know, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish for the most part last year and kind of set myself up for bringing new changes into my life for this year. And uh, that was, that was basically the sentiment for this year is bring it on. Gotcha. So we're bringing in some Kirsten Dunst kind of energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess oh, so. It's been brought. <laughs> it's been brought. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you didn't actually come up with a phrase at the end, we we're just going to say that whole little monologue there that was going to be the phrase. It's like, well, good. That's a easily memorable <laughs> phrase. Yeah, if anybody wants to borrow that, it's a little <laughs> lengthy, but. <laughs> we might get into stuff um, that was before 2020, but in the past two years, since we last um, had the opportunity to talk on the podcast, what has been one of the more interesting things that has happened in your life? Uh, Well, my kids, as of this coming Friday, we're recording this on a Sunday. And so as of this coming Friday, my youngest leaves the nest. So and it's been a transition, I feel like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a transition for everybody. If most kids, unless they're, you know, quintuplets or whatever, most of them leave at different times. So I have had that kind of easing into this experience from when, you know, the oldest flew and then the middle one flew and now the youngest is flying and he's going to California Friday, actually, he graduated high school. So that was a kind of big event in uh, May and now he is he's been accepted with a similar scholarship as his older brother which totally blows my mind to USC I mean just having two of my kids with these scholarships to USC is crazy and uh, I'm just so you know I'm not in the tax bracket to bribe anybody to do that so this is all legit <laughs> I know that was a thing back in 2020 and media but <clears throat> Well, so I mean, your guest experiences on Full House and right? um, <laughs> Desperate Housewives, it very much made me kind of think like, well, was Lorette one of those people that is gaming <laughs> the system? I mean, even though I've seen, you know, I don't know which son it was, so I apologize, but the one that made his movie, uh, I saw that after you had mentioned it and enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, that's this one. Okay, yeah, that's, the, that's okay. this one. That's okay. the youngest. He was, uh, he was in that movie called The Sneakover. It's like a, a kid's movie. And it was in a local theater for a little while, and they arranged for it to be in the local theater, which was kind of cool. But it is available on DVD at Walmart, and it's on um, Netflix, I think. And you can obviously get it on Amazon. Amazon well, it's Prime. definitely Amazon Prime. Yeah, yep. it's on Amazon Prime, and I, like one of the other ones, maybe Voodoo. But I know that okay. I had I had seen it on Amazon Prime, and of course purchased it and all of that stuff but it's cute it's a cute little kids movie yeah. and and your son yeah. plays the gross one so it makes yeah, it yeah, all yeah. the better <laughs> i'm so proud yeah, of yeah. him i know he stink, he stink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah that's that's the one that's my youngest and he's leaving for college um so that is a big change this year and that's kind of we've been transitioning to that for the entire year and that's been pretty cool um i still work for the funeral and cemetery industry so that's that still is what it is right now but you know uh i i met someone and i'm in a serious relationship and that's that's a big deal i mean at least to me i don't know if it is to everybody else listening but it is to me that's a pretty big deal this isn't a no audience is a no audience it's nobody's a nobody so obviously (laughs) um well, that's cool. Um, uh, can I ask more about that, or is that of something? That, okay, yeah, like, no, so how did course. that how that come about, or um, what's been like the coolest so, thing of having this new relationship? I met him on Facebook, 
And what's neat is that coincidentally, we just both happen to be from New York. And so I think there's just that immediate sense of kinship there, which is interesting because if, if, if you're from a certain place, like you're from Oklahoma, Mike, and then, you know, you're out and you're about uh, out and about running your day and you meet someone at the store and there they are and you're in Oklahoma and they're from Oklahoma, who cares, you know, but if you leave and you go and you're visiting Minnesota and you run into somebody that happens to also be from your town in Oklahoma, all of a sudden it's much cooler. You're like, right. oh, wow, cool. And you have this like instant, like, yeah, we got to be friends. Like we're besties now because we're both from, so it would there that kind of immediate connection was really intriguing to both of us, I think. And we are both, you know, displaced Yankees. And so we speak the same language, like our base language is the same. And that's pretty cool. And we also have a mutual friend that we discovered that uh, I had grown up with and he went to high school with. So that oh, was wow. kind of cool, too. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Very, very cool. So there was an instant connection and we just kept talking and got to know each other better and better and I mean he the first couple of dates we went on were like just outstanding like totally blew my mind so um I kind of was was feeling very giddy about it from the beginning and we're as today is three months as a matter of fact wow, oh, today's, wow. congratulations it's kind of a big day yeah thank yeah, you you're, you're, I mean <laughs> three month anniversary but you're revisiting the podcast so obviously right priorities and, and your kid is leaving in Five or six in a days. couple of days yeah. right it's also one of my best friend's birthday today so see it was, august 14th uh, is a big day i thought this out in advance <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate you mike thank you <laughs> but it's it's going really well uh, actually and um it's hard when you're the age that that we are and i hate to consider myself middle-aged but i guess if i live to 102 i am you know <laughs> well not well actually 99 would be middle-aged but anyway um <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's hard because there's, you know, I mean, not only are there not a whole lot of options, but by the time we get to the age that we are, we're not blank slates like we were when we were in our twenties yeah. or you know, teenagers. And we're kind of just figuring out who we are and kind of painting that the canvas is still kind of bare and we're painting as we go. And, you know, you can kind of hold the brush with somebody else by the time we get to our age and we've had all the experiences we've had in our life, both you know, both painful and ha happy experiences. We have all of these pebbles in our jar already and all of these brush strokes on our canvas already. And it's a, a little bit more difficult to kind of adapt to someone else because we're like, well, this is my way and this is my perspective and this is my idea of life. And well, okay, this is mine. And all right, how do we, how do we make this meld because we could become a little bit more rigid and naturally so we become a little bit more rigid rigid because we develop a, a certain pace for ourselves and a certain tone for our life so right. it does become a little bit more challenging and it, it does take a conscious effort to just maintain that emotional elasticity to say okay i'm gonna i want to have a significant person in my life and i want to allow myself to be a little bit more elastic about it and allow allow ourselves to blend together so that we can proceed. And what I've liked in these short three months that we've been together, which in the grand scheme of things is not that long, it's still very new, but what I've really liked is that we've been able to pace ourselves very well. We've been able to recognize that there is a little bit of a strain in, in the ability to blend and find the right colors to paint on that the canvas together, or at least you know push the two canvases together and say, okay, how do we make this match? Um, but the fact that we both acknowledge that has been very helpful. We've been able to communicate very well. And uh, I'm, I just feel very blessed. I feel like, you know, that God, the universe has, has really blessed me with the opportunity to bond with another person in this way. And it's been really cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I hope never to have to worry about that. But I am very happy for you because you're definitely a person who deserves uh, to have somebody if you choose to, to go and journey through life with. Um, Thank you. Um, I've always had a high respect for you and a high um, affection for you. So I'm, I'm really glad that you found somebody. Um, however, it works out in the end, um, at least right now you have somebody. So that's really cool. Thank um, you. I appreciate that. We do have something a little bit more serious to talk about. And um, I, I have had a couple of people ask, even since our last um interview and they were wanting a little bit more detail on 
unfortunately time didn't allow it and there's some other things going on but what is your obsession with making the bed in the morning <laughs> okay so funny story i'm also <laughs> i'm also the girl that makes the bed at a hotel which <laughs> the so the, this guy that i'm dating that has been like a not really I don't want to say it was contentious. It was just something that he noticed, like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> we're in a hotel. Like, why would you, what are you doing? And I just do, it's, it's habitual and not every time in every hotel, but most of the time I'll do it. So it is the very first opportunity. And the, I mean, all, all kidding aside, making the bed in the morning is, is more of a gesture, um, but it's aesthetics too. It is your very first opportunity of the day to accomplish something. And it's a simple thing to do that you can do right away. You just get out of bed and you make the bed, you fix the covers, you fix the pillows, you make it neat. And it gives me a sense of accomplishment at the onset of the day. And it really sets a positive tone for the rest of the day. Because if you start your day with an accomplishment, you get that momentum going and you're, you know, you just can keep rolling into that momentum. So it's, it's important to me. And it's been important to me for years to, to make the bed the first thing out of bed in the morning. Now on days that I'm off of work, I will kind of mosey out and come back later and make the bed when I'm ready to get dressed. But on days that I'm working, I normally make the bed the second I get up, the second I get out of bed. And then I look at it and I've, I've made it neat and it looks pretty and it's all smooth. And it just mentally makes me feel better when my environment is neat and clean. I don't, and I, somehow I don't, you're still friends with you know, me, despite me not yeah, being neat or clean. That's okay. I, you know, I accept people for who they are. And I know, who, I know who I am. I do. And that's okay. But I also know who I am. Chaos doesn't, I can thrive in chaos if I need to, but it's always got to be a controlled chaos, you know, but when my homes, especially my home space, my home environment needs to be my space of Zen. And I feel more Zen and I feel more calm and organized in my head when my home is organized aesthetically. So, oh, you know what? You can make fun of me for it. I don't care. I'm not making fun of you for it. I, so for those of you that yes, I, don't that know. That is my obsession. My obsession with making the bed in the morning is I really, really like the adrenaline and the rush of endorphins it gives me to have that sense of accomplishment. It pleases me first thing in the morning. All right. So at least we're understanding some of your generation X mind voodoo. Um, <laughs> so some of this started when, so for those, I don't think we actually talked about it much on the podcast before, but Lorette and I both met each other in a uh, public speaking competition for humorous speech. Mm -hmm. And afterward um, we connected and throughout the next, I would say year or two, we would, um, break you, uh, ah, goodness, my mind just went blank. We would uh, check in each other to basically kind of help with speeches and different kinds of things and stuff. And then Lorette, uh, was expanding your business for some of the different leadership and public speaking. So you, I, I got to be a guinea pig of sorts for, um, some of your productivity training. And mm -hmm. the one assignment she had for me is for 30 days, I had to make my bed every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, this became a lot of contention, <laughs> not just for just my attitude. It. <laughs> no, it wasn't just that. Um, even my, so my wife and I discovered Thanks. really early on in our marriage that um, in my opinion, she steals the covers in her opinion, I steal the covers. So we made a compromise. I want to say like two years in that she has her own set of covers because she likes multiple layers and stuff. And I like just a layer. So um, I have my blanket and she has her blankets and <laughs> she was not happy when I started messing with her side of the bed. <laughs> uh, so I made my half of the bed for 30 days and um, Lorette, you're like, Hey, so don't you feel better? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I actually feel like I wasted a lot of time <laughs> that I could have been doing literally anything else, like nothing. Um, however, that being said, I did, uh, uh, my cousin or my wife's cousin, Jenny found this app called Finch and it's like the stupidest thing in the world. Um, it really is. I mean, it's, it's cool, but it's stupid. And I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but I can, yeah. it's a, 
it's things that you can check off whenever you do it and you can do health related stuff. But one of the first things is when you wake up is take a deep breath in the morning and just enjoy the breath. And that Mm -hmm. is very satisfying to me, just taking that first deep breath in the morning. And um, so that's my making the bed. It's, it's oh well you know what if that if that works then yeah the same, the same activities are not going to work for everybody another well something I do mentally before I get out of bed when I first open my eyes and you know there are days because it, we're human and life is life and <clears throat> there are some days that you wake up in the morning and the first thought that occurs to you is I don't want to say all the time a negative thought, but maybe some kind of stress factor. You know, mm-hmm. you're thinking about everything that you have to accomplish that day, or you're thinking about something that irritated you the night before or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, I'm awake and I got to do this and I got to do this. So I've made a conscious effort and this has been going on for several years now. I have made a conscious effort to train myself out of that. And whatever first thought I have in the morning, I immediately try to take control of that and switch to gratitude. So while I'm still in the bed and I'm just kind of enjoying the the waking up process or trying to convince myself to wake up, right? I'll think about things that I'm grateful for. Like, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that it's a new day. I'm grateful that I get to do this today or that, or whatever it is that I get to do today. Um, you know, I'm grateful that I'm about to have my coffee because I love my morning coffee. And I just, even if it's just simple things, like, you know, I'm grateful that I still have feet or whatever it is, I will, I have trained myself to put my mind in a place of gratitude before I get out of the bed. And then, you know, I sit on the edge of the bed, I breathe. I I probably don't focus on it as much as, you know, you're saying, but I I take a little bit of a, a couple of deep breaths and then I get up, I turn on my light and I start making the bed and then I move forward. So different things really work for different people. And making the bed is an example. It's not something that, you know, everybody's going to get satisfaction out of my personality type. I do get satisfaction out of that type of thing. But if you found something that's really working for you, then then go for it, man. You do you. I also find as much sleep as possible is very accomplishing feeling. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I enjoy sleep. Sleep is normally a very good thing. Sometimes when I get up and I, after I get dressed and stuff, I just crumple up all the sheets and blankets on my side of the bed and just throw it on there just to just to realize that it's okay if things aren't right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, purposely mess it up. <laughs> yeah. Take that bed. For... <laughs> so those are some of the, so you mentioned some stuff that was a little bit interesting. We talked about the controversial um, bed making. <laughs> taboo topic what have you learned about yourself over the past two years that maybe surprises you a little bit more than it would have um, I mean I know you're a very introspective person and are self-aware and try to learn about yourself and get better and stuff but what's something since we last talked at least podcast wise that you've um, just found that's maybe something that you didn't expect about yourself hmm. oh gosh I feel like over the last several years, I've learned so much about myself. I, it's hard for me to compartmentalize it just into the last two years specifically. But over the last several years, I, I've i learned that I'm a lot stronger than I ever thought I was and a lot more capable of of managing life and life's mm-hmm. twists and turns. And that's really just by consequence. Like I, I was thrust into situations where, you know, you get into situations at the onset where you're like, Oh no, I don't think I can handle this. And then you do. And, you know, you realize at some point I have survived hundred percent of everything I've been through, you know, so I, I can do this. Um, and that was, that was important. I think, I've also learned a a lot about humility and realizing, so when I was raising my kids, I always considered myself to be very good at that. And I am, I, you know, I will still say that I am. And I never thought I was perfect as a mom, but as my kids become adults now and they start communicating me with me more about where they are in their lives and whatever they're, they're managing, uh, whatever problems they're managing or, um, parts of their lives that they're navigating now in their lives, they communicate with me. And I realize that 
and, and they'll tell me we have very good and very deep talks and I'm glad that we can talk like this. And they'll tell me, Hey, you know, remember like this phase of life and we used to do this. And I think it would have been better or it might've gone differently if, if we did it this way. And there have been times where I've had to kind of, you know, catch, catch my breath a little bit and say, what do you mean? Are you criticizing my mothering? You know? So I jumped to like the <laughs> ego part right away, you know? And, but we're able to have these honest conversations, which is a good thing. And I guess does speak to mothering well in, in the first place where they can communicate these thoughts and feelings effectively with me. And I'm able to kind of catch myself and say, you know what, that's interesting. That's an interesting perspective. And yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And, you know, so there was, there's a lot of humility as the kids become adults. And I'm glad that they're not like, you know, they're not really, um, they're not criticizing me in so far as like you ruined me or anything like that. It's just like, Hey, um, this happened and this is a byproduct of it. And I think it would have been better if we do it this way, or even in the present, like uh, a lot of times, especially with my daughter, she's really good about this. We'll get into a conversation where she'll need some kind of input or advice. And the way that I'm delivering the information isn't really working for her. And she's very good about kind of, hitting pause for a second and say, okay, the way that this, this is going is not working for me. Can, can we maybe divert a little bit and refocus? And <clears throat> I've had to learn some humility in that and kind of take a step back and say, okay, I want to, I want to do this in the way that's going to be beneficial for both of us. So the way that you're asking me to communicate with you is just as important as the way I want to communicate. So let's, let's refocus and regroup. Um, so I've learned that I'm stronger than, than I ever thought I am. Um, and that's been a transition over several years. I've, I've also learned a lot of lessons in humility. Uh, and I'm, in, I'm still currently really in a place. And I know this, this sounds, it might sound weird to say this at my age, but I'm still kind of in a place of figuring out what I want to do when I grow up, you know? <laughs> because I, I feel like I'm ready to kind of transition. And I felt this way for quite some time now and I haven't really landed on anything. So I feel like I'm still in a place of learning and still in a place of growth and figuring out like, okay, what I have all of this experience in, in my life, but all of these skills that I've collected and all of these different experiences that I've had and all of these different things that I've done, and what do I wanna do with it? Like, where, right. do, where do I wanna take my life now? And what do I wanna be? Um, and I, I know it's common for people to like switch careers midway through. And I think I'm kind of in that place now where I'm, I'm ready for that. And I'm still kind of learning, all right, who am I though? Who am I? And you know, what is it that I really want to offer the world? What is it that I really can offer the world that would be of some kind of meaningful value, you know? Yeah. Um, I know that that, that question just drove me crazy. I want to say for the better part of the past 10 years easily and at least for I would say probably for the past six or seven months that's not been as bad um, for me like that hasn't been as driving trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up <laughs> um, and, and well have you of, have you landed on something like is that why it's not driving you crazy anymore because you've landed on something or because you've just like released the idea of stressing about it um, I don't think I'll ever release stressing about it <laughs> because <laughs> as I'm one of those um, people that I honestly don't think, you know, retirement's going to be there when I turn 65 or 70. Um, if I stop working, it's probably going to be because my body won't let me work anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I think part of it is I'm in a safer space now. Um, and I know things can be in flux, but I, I uh, one of my friends told me, uh, so last, last year I transitioned from a very high stress job to a very low stress, if any stress job. And for the first few months, I was like, man, this is horrible. Cause I was actually getting sick from de-stressing and, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but I have a good boss and I have some good coworkers and it's made it a lot easier to just enjoy the fact that at least for the first time in, like I said, 10, 15 years, I've not had to worry in the same way. I'm still, you know, building up skills, still creating opportunities because I, I do know that the world is flux. Um, but despite that, I don't feel pressure that if something like tomorrow, if I don't feel good, I can call in sick and mm -hmm. my boss isn't going to punish me. And I'm not going to feel, I mean, I might feel a little regret because I, 
don't like calling in sick, but if I'm sick or if I just need to take time off, there's not, there's not a stigma like, um, oh goodness, what, what world have we left behind? You know, you're making the world worse because you weren't here or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's not that kind of thing. So it's a little bit safer. And I think with that safety, it's just allowed me to not make that my overarching question right now. Um, the changes happen all the time. So, you know, two days from now, it might be like, well, I need to find out what I want to do with my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can relate. I can relate to that very much. I'm right now for the past few years, I've worked in sales, which is kind of organic for me. I've, I've been in sales for so long and I've done it for so long in many different ways and many different varieties of sales. And this certainly what I'm doing now is the most challenging that I've ever done. And that's more for the uh, human emotional aspect of it that's added right. to it. But it is a, a high stakes environment and it is a commission only environment, which sounds like a lot of fun, but it's <laughs> not. <laughs> so the pros and cons are the pros is that it's pretty much unlimited. When it's commission only, they don't cap your commission because that's, that's it. That's your salary. You know, you go for it and you make it and that's just how it is. But the reality is that in any sales environment, you're mostly in control and you, the harder you work, the more, the more you're able to make, but there are some factors that you can't control. And depending upon what industry you're in, there are some outside factors that you have no control over. So there is going to be a decline sometimes that will cause you the pressure to have to try um, even harder. And sometimes no matter how, how fast you're spinning your wheels, the incline is so steep that you're, you're just going to move more slowly than you would at other times. Not saying you still won't move. You will as long as you're pedaling, but it, it will become more stressful and more exhausting at times to, to try to reach that peak. And there are naturally, and anybody that's been in sales for any period of time knows that, it's just an organic part of the process. It's never where you reach the the climax and then you just stay there and you stay on on that high. You mm-hmm. just don't. There are always going to be peaks and valleys. And those valleys are kind of stressful and it's very hard. And you are in a situation where because it's commission only, you don't get PTO or you, you don't get any of that. So you can pretty much take off anytime you want, but you also can't. Right. Because if you're depending upon where you are in that peak or or valley process, you know that you're sacrificing and you're taking a big risk and you're rolling the dice, you know, if, if you take off any significant amount of time and sometimes just even calling in sick, you're not able to stay home and just rest and recuperate and take care of yourself because you're worried about like, what opportunities am I missing? Who's going to be mad at me? Is anybody thinking that, you know, I should be there and whatever. Um, so there is a a lot of stress and there are a lot of aspects of working in sales that I really love. And I, I feel that I'm very good at it for this reason. Like I take it seriously and I enjoy serving people in meaningful ways. I enjoy helping them improve their lives or benefit their lives in some ways. And that's basically what sales is. It's not like we see in the movies and coffees for closers and all that BS. It's, it's somebody that does it for a career understands that I, I enjoy helping people and benefiting their lives in a meaningful way. And this is the compensation that I receive for it. And I'm totally okay with that. But at the same time, there's that stress factor on the other end of it. So you get to a certain point in your life or a certain age, and maybe some of us don't, but a lot of us do, where we're like, okay, I'm, I'm getting a little burnt out. Mm-hmm. So how do I take all, and I need to be at a safer place in my life. I need to know that, you know, there's going to be a little bit more stability and that becomes more important. I think when you're younger, that's not as important, but when you get older, that, be, that starts to become very important, that kind of stability and consistency starts to become a little bit more important. And I am in that place where I'm starting to think, well, what, what do I want to do? How do I want to take all the skills and knowledge that I've acquired over the years and turn it into something new, turn it into something else um, that might give me the, the stability and consistency that I'm looking for, while at the same time being able to fulfill myself emotionally, uh, you know, simultaneously. Um, so I'm, I'm in that place right now. And I'm, I'm trying to learn about myself and trying to learn like what, what's important to me and what's, what's going to matter to me as I move forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, there's nothing controversial about what you said. So I guess, uh, oh, no, okay. you're wrong. I'll try to give you something no, more controversial. No, no, time. that's fine. <laughs> uh, there's one other area I want to at least briefly mention because even though, well, yeah, I'll say it this way. Um, so as you know, and uh, the people on this show have get, gotten to hear whether they liked it or not, uh, I've been involved in improv <laughs> now for just over a year. Yeah. And, um, and even though there's a couple of people from the local theater who have been instrumental for me being involved with this group, um, you were actually the one that kind of introduced me to what improv actually was. And so I want to say mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It's so much fun, isn't it? Yes. Uh, it's every, and I listening back um, through the episode just last night, because I wanted to, you know, see if there's any specific points to bring back and, the things that you mentioned about um, the team aspect where there's always somebody else to play with. And, um, and then I would take it a little bit further that the focus isn't just on me. It's so if there's a good show, then the team, your troop or whatever, the group you're with, they're the ones all together have made it good. One person mm -hmm. doing good just completely can ruin a show because yeah, they might've been great, but if everybody else looked horrible, then it wasn't, everybody wasn't on the same page. And um, mm -hmm. so it might seem good, but it really wasn't. And I, so I thank you for that, uh, that I uh, wish we could have started something when I know there's all the other politics stuff in Toastmasters at the time, but it would have been kind of cool if um, I know you were talking about doing some workshops and stuff for that. And that would have been really cool. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have been really cool. I, I miss improv. I do. I miss doing improv. It was a lot of fun. And I feel like I, I learned a lot. I mm -hmm. really did not just about performance and comedy, but there are a lot of rules of improv, quote unquote, that can really, you can really take and apply to your life in general, especially right. in communication skills. So it was a lot of fun. If we ever have the opportunity to perform together, um, then I would definitely take that opportunity. I loved watching your journey as you would post it on social media and I'm kind of proud of you, you know, <laughs> because I know that it's not easy to, to break into that, but it's, it's definitely a, a wonderful positive experience, especially if you're working with a team that, that is very uh, into that collaborative effort and right. understanding that it really does take a, a team to offer a good show to an audience. You know, and you get that back and forth, that give and take from the audience that just increases the level of energy and makes it better and better. Now, and this will actually be after the fact, because I think it's going to be about a month from now when your episode, this episode will go live. But um, so at the end of August, Craig Euler is actually coming into Oklahoma City to do a couple of workshops. Um, I'm not sure, sure if you're familiar with Craig Euler or not. No, actually, I'm not. Okay, well, if you're interested, you can come down to Oklahoma City for four hours on a Saturday and four hours on a Sunday and take workshops. Well, <laughs> I love that invitation and I appreciate it. But the last weekend of August is my birthday and my boyfriend's taking me away. So <sighs> that sounds like a jerk. No, no. <laughs> I take back everything I said. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but if there is ever another open opportunity, then yeah. I, I would I would love to do that sometime. Yeah, uh, I don't really I haven't really been following the scene here in Tulsa um, as far as improv. I know there is still some shows going on somewhere, but I don't I haven't been following it for a while, so I don't right. really know what's happening here. Well, one of the kind of cool things um, that has happened is Ryan Archibald. Uh, he lives in Jinx area, but he comes down and teaches classes, and then. Um, one every once in a while so he was at second city and io um mm. for i mean he taught people like, he taught like amy polar and team at tina fey and stuff oh, a wow. little bit um but he came into oklahoma and then a couple other people from chicago they just moved to oklahoma early last year or mid last year and so they started a group um that's completely chicago style improv uh called the swamp and I know they've performed a few different times up in Tulsa area, but um, every once a month they come down to Oklahoma City. And it's it's always just fun, not just as someone watching great improv being done, but also watching all the like all my teachers and staff members from OKCI that they're the way they respond to it is almost as enjoyable as watching the show itself, because you know, 
not taking away from Oklahoma, but the style of improv and some of the pacing and everything is just so different to have these three people who never played with each other in Chicago, but they all knew each other. Then <laughs> yeah. they're, they're playing together now. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why Craig Euler is coming down because um, he was friends and helped co-taught and stuff with them up in Chicago. So um, this will all be edited out because it doesn't really mean much, especially when it's in the past to the <laughs> people listening. <laughs> no, but, it's, it's um, very cool though. Yeah. And I, I know Ryan, um, he's trying to do some stuff up in Tulsa as well. Um, this is why I know it won't be on the podcast because I don't know what his vocal intentions are, but he's hoping to, I think, start a theater in Tulsa or um, make it where improv is a little bit more available and stuff. So sweet. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been, um, it's been a very fun group of people to work with over the past little over a year and stuff. And, and I think it's in three weeks, three weeks, uh, I officially graduate all the base levels. So I'm eligible to not suck. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. I love that. That's funny. <laughs> well, I still can choose to, but I don't have to at that point. <laughs> um, My experience with improv, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I talked about this on on the last improv, uh, on the last episode uh, that we did together, <clears throat> is that I, I did learn something about myself in in that area and like I've, I've always done public speaking presentations and that's different. And I know that you and I had talked about where I never considered myself uh, a very funny person. I mean, right. there's context humor that I can drop a line here and there, or, you know, say something and my silly accent that'll make people laugh. But so it was challenging for me to do the humorous speech in Toastmasters. And I was very proud of myself for getting as far as I did. Um, but improv was a really, really interesting experience because, because you're collaborating, like you were saying, you're collaborating with other people. So you, you have to pay attention and you mm -hmm. have to be observant of what's going on around you. You have to take what the audience is giving you and turn it into something. And then you have the givers and the receivers and improv. And I learned about myself that I'm better at taking what somebody else on stage is receiving from the audience. And like, they'll, they'll take the prompt and they'll do something with it and then I'll receive it and do something more with it and then throw it back out to the audience. And that was where I found my niche in improv was, okay, like this is what I'm good at. I've tried like the different areas and I seem to be much better at this is kind of receiving that. <clears throat> right. And once I found that, uh, and you know, I found my stride in that and I just accepted that, okay, this is where I excel. It, it just became that much more fun, but on a, on a deeper level, I, and I think a lot of people in general that have seen improv and don't really know the, the ins and outs of it or the construct of it, there is a construct to it. And there are rules of comedy and rules of improv. And one of two actually rules that I've learned in improv that I've been able to apply to real life communication, real life circumstances and relationships with other people is one, the rule of three, like three is a really, really good balance. And I, mm -hmm. I happen to have a, an affinity for the number three in general, because I think there's a lot of symbolism in the number three um, in just many different areas of life and many different right. things that we learn. But that rule of three is a very psychological balanced number. So you have that rule of three because, you know, you do it twice and it's cool. You do it three times and you kind of can hit it out of the park. Um, you do it four times and that's, you, you've jumped the shark, you know, <laughs> like you can't, you, it gets played out after a while. So just like a stool really only needs three legs to stand. That fourth one sometimes is just an encumbrance. You have to treat it the same way. So I've been able to apply that in, to my life in many different ways, especially doing other kind of educational presentations or when I do information or um, I'm in kind of a sales presentation with people. I know that they're only really going to remember three things that I tell them or three important facts that I give them. So that's all I'm going to give them you know, right. or else then it's up to them what they remember. And the other thing that I found very useful in my life in communicating, especially having difficult conversations with people is the yes and rule, you know, because you can shut a scene down really quickly and it can bomb if you deny, if you didn't, like the audience gives you a prompt and then somebody takes the prompt and turns it into something. And then if the, you know, if your partner on stage just shuts it down and says, no, 
you're kind of like, oh, dude, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, where do we go from here? You just closed every door. We have no path now, you know? So it's kind of that yes and concept. And it, right. it keeps the conversation going forward. It keeps the momentum moving forward. It keeps the energy up. And that, I found that a very valuable tool in just having regular conversations, even difficult conversations with people to take the information that they're offering or their opinion or whatever it is that they're contributing to the conversation. And I don't have to physically say yes and, but the concept to me is like, okay, I'm receiving what you're saying and I'm going to contribute this to do it and we're going to keep the momentum moving forward and yeah. things are much more productive relationships are much more productive everything in general is much more productive when you take that approach instead of you know letting your ego getting and get in the way of something and just kind of putting your hand over their face and shutting it down because now everything stagnates and everything just kind of bombs after that so those are two very important rules concepts that i i learned from improv that have improved my life well, just from being funny <laughs> even your theme of this year bring it on as a form of yes and it's saying it whatever is. becomes my way i'm going to take it and move forward with it so it's right um it's great <laughs> right right uh, it must know? be it must be difficult being great all the time oh stop it <laughs> <laughs> i just shut you down right there i shouldn't have done that so when you said that i should have said yes no, no, you're just taking on a character and you're, you're fulfilling the character and you're inviting me to give you even more praise about how great you are, oh, how smart you are, and for the rule oh, of three, how strategic you are. There you go. And knocked it out of the park. <laughs> We, it's too bad it's and you're also oh crap as for no. ah no you <laughs> killed it now you jumped the shark <laughs> hey if this were live we can take suggestions to the audience you know mm -hmm. give me a place and occupation <laughs> well Lorette, i thank you so much for the time that you have allowed me to talk to you again <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sound a lot worse though no but thank you for agreeing to be back on this uh it's always a pleasure of talking to you and i, I think we need to make a habit of doing it a little bit more often not just for podcast reasons but um yeah i'm, I'm so for excited sure. for I, the... well we have been in touch over the last few years i, yeah. I can remember several times that we you, we've been in touch for different reasons and that's always it's always a good thing it's always good to hear from you so i appreciate the opportunity to be on it and i'll i'll take this and i'm sorry for interrupting you but i know we're almost out of time and i want to take just a small opportunity to uh in going back to what i was saying before and trying to figure out what i want to do when i grow up i have been giving a lot of very serious consideration and actually talking to the the man in my life about it my boyfriend and he's offering me a lot of encouragement into starting a whole other podcast. And um, <clears throat> what has inhibited me before is I felt like, well, I, had, I got nothing. I got nothing to talk about. I got nothing to say, but I, I don't really think that it's necessary to force myself into a specific niche or a specific genre. I find that when I'm having conversations with interesting people, it normally, the conversations are good, you know, and not all of them are for the public, but some of them can be edifying. So think maybe I'll do some with him as well. I think he'd make a really good partner. And what I would like to do when I, when I do, I got my microphone out and I dusted it off. I just haven't right. hooked it up yet. <laughs> when I, when I do hook it up and when I do decide to push record, I, I'd love to invite you for a conversation. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. think it could go really well. That'd be awesome. I'd love it. And green, love it. Awesome. Green. Yeah. Those are three things. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it balanced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, no, but Laura, uh, you are some one of the people I love the most. Uh, that's one reason why you're going to be, well, you're, you have been now because at the time of recording, it's going to be, but at the time of publication, it will have been. It's one of those things that's always confusing, but you'll be the first revisited podcast um, interview. And uh, I'm so glad that it gets to be you. And I'm thankful for you. Um, I'm glad for the positive impact that you've made on the world, uh, not just through your kids, um, who are awesome. Uh, well, at least one of them is. I mean, the other two seem pretty cool too. But, um, <laughs> but the, the way that you just approach life um, has been fun at the very least. Uh, it's always been informative. And even if you kind of have a little bless your heart attitude towards it, <laughs> you still make your bed. So, you know. <laughs> 
should we, should we explain that or should we just uh, leave they it can go space? they can go back to the old podcast for the bless your heart <laughs> or we'll just bring it up on the next the next revisited or whatever <laughs> yeah but thank you <laughs> okay. thank you so much and uh, we will talk again soon all yeah. right awesome thank you so much mike it's been an honor and a pleasure as always mm-hmm. and we'll be in touch Once again, I want to thank Lorette for being our first guest to come back and talk about life. She is a living inspiration for me and hopefully for you. And for you out there, as the world seems to act as if nothing has happened over the past two years, know that there are people who love and care about you. No matter who you are, where you come from, or what you've done, you are valuable. Nobody is a nobody, and that means you. Until next time.